today we want to uh, kind of wave our hands at Stokes theorem, which is our last fundamental theorem of calculus that we'll encounter here in Calc 3. Stokes theorem is a fundamental theorem of calculus that we're going to apply to the curl. You can also think of this as the curl theorem. Remember that the structure of a fundamental theorem of calculus is we're integrating over a set some kind of derivative by evaluating the function at the boundary of the set. So we integrate over some set uh, derivative by evaluating the function at the boundary of the set. Originally, this showed up uh, with the integral from A to B of F prime of X to X and taking F of X, the function evaluated at the boundary, F of B minus F of A. Here, the derivative was, to our, was just our original derivative, derivative with respect to X. The set was the interval from A to B and the boundary of the set is the, those points A and B. But that's the structure of something that we will call a fundamental theorem of calculus. The integral over some set of a derivative will be evaluating the function at the boundary of the set. So, other versions of this we saw in the divergence theorem. In the, di for, in the divergence theorem, the integral of the divergence of a vector field over some solid in R3 is the vector field, uh, the, the surface integral of the vector field at the boundary of the solid. We think of divergence as the, the flux dense of uh, the outwardness of the vector field at any given point. And we can add all that up inside of a solid by just looking at what the function is doing at the boundary. So instead of looking at every single point, calculating f prime of x dx at all the points between a and b, we just look at the antiderivative or the function. I said derivative. So if this is the derivative, we just look at the function at the boundary, but how the, in this case, how the function has changed at the boundary. This also gives us some kind of insight into what each of these derivatives is telling us. The derivative f prime of x is telling us the instantaneous rate of change at every single point. So when we're doing this at all the points between a and b, we're looking at how the function is changing over that interval. If we look at how much divergence is, uh, we have at every point in a vector field, how much each point is behaving like a source, when we add all that up, it's just how much the vector field is moving out of that surface, of that solid. So the that's telling us what the divergence uh, um, how the divergence is a derivative and how it relates in a fundamental theorem. If we look at all the points at all these little pieces, how much the vector field is out, is diverging, is moving out, we can sum all that up and just look at how much it's moving out through the surface, through the boundary of that solid. So that's our fundamental theorem of calculus, <clears throat> calculus <clears throat> for divergence. We get the divergence theorem. We have a sim. Oh, yeah. Question. So we're finding that it runs divergence of every single point in the That's how much that finds uh, how much the function is uh, flowing through the surface. Or oh, sorry, not the function. How much the vector field is flowing through that surface? Oh, right. So this is going back to this is going back. This takes it back to surface um, uh, surface integrals. Remember our our core concepts. We have a line integral. It's how much a vector, we can think about how much a vector field is helping or hindering some path through the vector field. We think of a surface integral, while our 
our core concept there was the vector field flowing through some surface, like water flowing through that circle. The del operator, the divergence is the del operator of the vector field. So we take the divergent, uh, sorry, it's the dot product of the del operator and the vector field, and that calculates the divergence. So from a structure standpoint, we're reading divergence of the vector field as the derivative and the vector field itself as a function. W is the set over which we are integrating the derivative and S is the boundary of that set. W is a solid with boundary surface S. We're going to do the same thing with the curl. Um, so for the curl, our fundamental theorem of calculus is Stokes' theorem. So we're going to be integrating the curl of a vector field. Think about the things that we need. The curl of a vector field is going to be a vector. So this multiplication is going to have to be a dot product. So what we're looking at is the curl of a vector field at all points on some surface. Remember the curl of a vector field, it's a vector telling us the direction and the magnitude of the maximum curl, how much the vector field is, tends to spin things around. how much at every point in the vector field, the vector field is going to spin something around and the axis where we find the maximum amount of spin. So if we're looking at the spin of the vector field at every point on a surface, we'll just evaluate the vector field at every point on the boundary of that surface. So S is a surface with boundary C. C is the boundary of the surface S. So S is going to be some surface in R3, because we only have the R3 curl. So we got the surface, and it has a boundary of C. So we have to define some things. Let's talk about what we mean here. So if we've got some surface, this is where I have to draw something like a contact lens. It's the difficult part. So I'm just going to draw an inverted contact lens. Not quite. Yeah. 
Kind of. So imagine we got this surface. Think of it as like a bowl or a contact lens. The boundary of this surface is going to be that circle up on top. So the boundary C of this surface S is going to be like that cir the circle on top. That's going to be our boundary of this surface. We're not worried about the stuff in the middle. We're worried about what's going on at the boundary of the surface. The surface needs to have some kind of orientation. I'm going to assign the orientation to be going like, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, let's say the orientation is kind of flowing down. So remember, we're imagining the surface is just a bunch of normal vectors. What we have to do in calculus is break things up into small pieces where stuff isn't changing. That's the whole problem in calculus. Calculus is, is, is calculating with continuous change. We deal with continuous change by breaking it up into little pieces where stuff isn't changing. Isn't changing. The way we imagine an oriented surface is that the surface is a bunch of normal vectors. So if we take the thumb of our right hand and point it in the orientation of the surface, which is generally down, that gives us where we should uh, assign the orient, how we should assign the orientation of the boundary. So our boundary is going around this way. If you don't like the boundary going like this, if you think that's kind of messy, I don't like it, there. Now it's going the other direction. But now I have to write upside down for the rest of the class. Right. So, so here's our surface with an orientation. Oh, this is much more comfortable. I should have drawn it this way. I actually can't draw them, the top part. This is why, like in Cal 2, it was always like, oh, I'm just going to take a bowl and I'm going to put water in it. It's like, oh, what if you have like a gas that's floating at the top? And then I have to draw my circles this way and I can't do it. It's like it's like in Zoolander where you can't turn back. That mm -hmm. kind of thing. I can't draw a deal. Has anybody even seen that movie? No. Oh, the knees If cycles hold, it'll make a comeback when people that were 14 years old and saw that movie and really liked it get into their late 40s and early 50s and become in charge of studios. And it's like, oh, hey, I'm going to start making the stuff that I saw when I was a kid. That, that's why you see a bunch of stuff from like the mid 80s, because people that were 14 
in the mid 80s are in the halls of power now and can decide what to green light to put in the movie theaters. That's why Ghostbusters is bad because a bunch of dumbasses with no creativity my age are in creative fields and like, uh, let's make Ghostbusters again because that was good. I like that. Right. On the plus side, that is like one of the few comedies that you can remake from the 80s. The rest of it is just like a, a minefield of horrors. So that's all beside the point. I just wanted you to be able to copy down this surface. Now, this surface is just sitting there. All around this surface, we've got a vector field. And that vector field is moving stuff around. If we look at a point, we could see like if it's if things are really swirly. So like a, think about a whirlpool. Think about a whirlpool near the center of that whirlpool. It's tending to swirl quite a bit. Far away from the whirlpool, it's not swirling that much at all. So we're imagining the whirlpool swirling a lot here, so a big magnitude. And if it's if the whirlpool is going, uh, everything is sinking. We've all seen Pirates of the Caribbean where the ship is like going down the whirlpool like this, right? There's a lot of swirl as it as it turns down. The curl is just measuring the direction and the magnitude of the maximum curl. So the vector field is producing curl at all the points on this surface. The vector field is producing some kind of curl at all the points on this surface. And so that means that all these points on the surface, I've got some kind of uh, curl caused by the vector field. And I'm taking the dot product of that curl and the uh, norm, a vector normal to the surface, because that's what a surface is, integral is about. How is the vector field flowing through the surface? How is that curl interacting with the surface, Nor the vectors normal to the surface? So here we are adding up the curl at all the points on this surface. And we're, we can measure that just by looking at the vector field going around the boundary of the surface. Rather than adding up the curl at all the points on the surface, we just look at how the vector field is flowing around the boundary of the surface. So all that curl is summed up by looking at the vector field at the boundary. All the spin at all the points on the surface, we can sum that up by looking at the vector, by evaluating the vector field around the boundary of the surface. And we are literally summing it up because these are integrals. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. When we can't multiply because things are different, we switch to addition. This goes all the way back to the first thing that we did after we learned how to count. The first thing you do after you learn how to count is you'll learn how to add. Any questions? How's everybody okay? Once again, at all the points on this surface, the vector field is causing some kind of spin, whatever direction that spin is going. We're finding the dot product of that spin and a normal vector to the surface. Instead of adding up the spin at all the points on the surface, just evaluate the vector field going around the boundary surface. I'll go to our bench. For those of you watching at home, this seems hand wavy. That's only because it was hand wavy. If you were here in the room, I was waving my hands a whole lot during this whole thing. So everybody in the room can attest the fact that Leach was waving his hands a lot. How's everybody okay? Everybody looks so stoked. You all look like this. You should be happier about this because this is like literally Stokes theorem. I mean, you should be just way more excited about this fucking theorem. Maybe it's just my presentation. I mean, the poker face in the math. That's true. Y'all have epic poker face. So I can't defeat that. 
So if you're like, oh, I'm not really comfortable with my understanding of divergence in Perl, that is correct. You shouldn't have a good understanding about divergence in Perl. I've talked about it for probably a total of 30 minutes for, uh, total for both of them. And I've just been waving my hands at it. We're just trying to get a notion of what's going on. Divergence, curl. Divergence, curl. How much is the divergence is how much the vector field is moving out. It's the outwardness of the vector field. Curl is how much the vector field is turning. The idea behind that, since we're making a derivative and it's a vector, it's telling us the direction and magnitude of maximum amount. Now, just like in the gradient, how is the the function changing? It's changing in a lot of different ways, but the gradient tells you the direction and the magnitude of maximum change. Uh, the boundary is the, in this case it's a circle uh, the it, it's it is that circle the circumference is just a characteristic of that boundary and it's only a circle because I drew it as a circle but the boundary is the whole the boundary is that whole circle going around no the surface is the whole thing the surface is the whole contact lens the boundary of the surface is just that circle on top think of it um think of it like uh we're making a soap bubble but not like letting the soap like detach from the ring you make a ring out of a coat hanger or whatever and you dip that in the soapy water right now you have a surface that's a circle that's where the bubble is. That's the surface. And then the coat hanger represents the boundary of that surface. Now, the idea is that whatever in Stokes theory, when we're looking at the curl of a vector field, whether we have that soap bubble just sitting there flat, it's just like, oh, vector field at the boundary. It's like, oh, but the soap bubble is flat. Does that change anything? No, vector field at the boundary. And then if we start moving forward a little bit, then that soap bubble is going to bulge out the back, right? That circle, the coat hanger, is still the boundary of the surface. So as we pull that uh, soap bubble, starts pulling out the back of our thing because we're walking forward, but not too fast because we don't want the bubble to attach. And we just so the surface is all distorted, that distorted bubble shape. The boundary is still just the coat hanger. So the vector field. So when we want to calculate how much the vec a vector field is swirling at all those points on the surface, we don't care what the shape is, what's going on with the vector field around the boundary of that surface. Vector field at the coat hanger is the curl at all the points on the bubble. Okay. I'm going to go into another class. We have to talk about vector calculus. I'm going to go, wait a second. Is this like the bubble that we're talking about or like the coat hanger that we're making the bubble with? And then I know I'm in trouble because your your next professor in like some advanced math class will be like, oh, all right, who was your Cal three teacher? Mm -hmm. Then I'll get an email. I was like, oh, where's this email from? Fucking Stanford? Oh, God. That's why I have to block all the math faculty from Stanford. And what the fuck are you telling people? Any questions? How's everybody okay?
You make it through these things and it's curl and curl. Yeah, we gotta think about how we're making the 2D shape, right? So um We got to think, uh, so there's a lot that goes into uh, like specifically defining what the boundary of a surface for which this applies, right? There's always all kinds of stuff that we're ignoring. When I write integral from A to B of F prime of X dx is equal to F of X at, uh, from A to B, that's not enough to write the fundamental theorem of calculus. We can write it that way because we're sophisticated Calc 3 students. Y'all are sophisticated Calc 3 students. So you know that there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it. But if we wanted to state it properly to non like Calc 3 students or not, or just like students that are in Calc 1, you can't be like, well, integral from A to B of F prime of X to X is F of X at F of X from A to B. You have to say, let F be continuous on the closed interval from A to B. Then the integral from A to B of F of X to X is capital F at B minus capital F at A where capital F is an antiderivative of little f. Then when they're like, oh, what about functions that don't have an antiderivative? Then you can be like, oh, second part of the fundamental theorem of cognitive says that if f of x is continuous on the closed interval from A to B and C is any value from, it, from that interval, then capital F of x defined to be the definite integral from C to X of F of P to G is an antiderivative. That's you need that second part so you can justify just using the word antiderivative. Because as soon as you invoke the word antiderivative, you cause problems. Because some functions don't have nice antiderivatives. You're like, oh, we need non-elementary functions or an infinite number of terms if you're going to be like all well, antiderivative. At which point you like pull out the second fundamental theorem of calculus card. That's like the Uno reverse. So I get to use that word. Any questions? Does Uno still exist as a card game? All right. So this is very hand wavy. This is very think piece. I just want you thinking about these, divergence and curl. Divergence at all the points, just look at the function, the vector field flowing through the surface, flowing through the boundary. Not the curl, uh, instead of the curl at every single point, just look at the vector field at the boundary of the surface. All right, that's it for today. Your homework is not to write anything down, just to think about stuff. Mm -hmm. That's it for today. I'll see you all on tomorrow. Have a good day and thanks for playing. I forgot to